happy to see you. I know we'll have people kind of trickling in here over the next couple minutes. Um, so I've just kind of have our CAN, uh, the COVID response CAN overview up on the screen. Just a reminder that we do have a limited amount of meetings left in this series. Um, and I say that just to be really mindful of the traction and the progress that we're making as we continue to meet together. Um, I'm really excited to say that we have made a little bit more headway on getting some more coaching and training opportunities um, on the calendar for you all. So keep an eye out for those invitations. Uh, I also want to recognize that our next meeting will be on December 1st, okay? So we've got a little bit of time in between meetings here. Also recognizing that we know you all are meeting um, in between in your focus groups. For today's results, we're going to um, kind of chunk things up in three parts here. We're going to do our gracious space check-in. Uh, we're going to take a little bit time, about 20 minutes, to continue setting targets for your performance measures on how we're working together differently. Really excited to have the remote living and learning group come, or remote learning and living, I believe, uh, uh, share the work that they're doing so that we can kind of just see what their small test of change is all about, provide some thought partnerships, and then we'll spend the rest of our time in differentiated work or in your focus group. Um, also, just a quick reminder that if you are available for an additional 30 minutes after our call today, we would love to have you join us for um, supporting the backbone and doing some continuous improvement around our coaching and facilitation skills. I'm just going to take a pause here on our working agreements and um, invite you in the chat or if someone wants to unmute and offer a working agreement that you can lean in today. Um, I know there's a lot of frenetic energy. There's a lot going on. It's a big day in our country. So um, definitely want to invite people to take a moment to be really present and focused um, and kind of hear from you all on what you want to lean into today. I would also offer if you need something different, like if you need a moment, if you need to check this, um, definitely want to hear from you all. This is your meeting, and this needs to feel like the right space for you all. So what's coming up for you when you think about what you need from today? Checking for understanding. Thank you. Breathing. Yes. <laughs> I just left my meditation cushion and it was hard to breathe. I'm not going to lie. I was like, you're still kind of breathing. <laughs> so I'm with you on that one, Patrick. Breathing is hard for me today as well. So I appreciate that. I'll be working on that today as well. Okay, one more reassurance that we are in this community. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Paul, do you want to speak, speak more to that? Like, what exactly would that look or feel like for you? Yeah, uh, thank you. Sorry, I was eating my breakfast. But uh, uh, just uh, reassurance that, uh, you know, Wednesday will come and Thursday and Friday and all the other days thereafter. And uh, some of the things that we still need to do in the community, regardless of whether our candidate uh, succeeded or did not succeed, will still have to be done. And we can't, uh, we can't ignore that. We still have an obligation to, to each other and to community. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Okay, thank you all. Uh, not a requirement, but just a reminder that if you would like to provide your pronouns or any other identifying information as well as like your racial identity, we invite you to do that. Is it not a part of our meeting to de design today, so you do not have to, um, but just an invitation if you would like to. Um, also, if you're new to this space, please provide your email in the chat box. 
I already gave you the reminder that if you can hang out for an extra 30 minutes, we'd appreciate it. Uh, and then we're going to do gracious space. So I know a couple of you were able to join us to watch our TED Talk earlier this morning or a few moments ago. Um, and hopefully for the rest of you, you were able to watch this video on your own time. Um, I love nerdy data stuff, and so I really appreciated this um, this study and uh, really love the tie into our work and thinking about what's most critical. And Paul kind of spoke to this is like how we're working together, making decisions, um, and continue to show up and do the work in our community. So I want to just give folks a moment to reflect on how are you creating space for others' perspectives? Um, there's a typo there, I apologize. Others' perspectives in your decision making. So what does that look like? And you might be reflecting on what that looks like at home, what that looks like with your children or your partner, what that looks like in the workplace. And in just a moment, Vicki is going to be moving us into uh, our breakout. Uh, you're going to be in trios for about 10 minutes and I'm inviting you to talk about um, <clears throat> and if you could really focus on the work that's happening in your focus group, um, what is coming to consensus look like? Uh, according to uh, Mariano, um, consensus making is just kind of a part of the human condition. It's a pattern of behavior that they can find in their studies. Um, and a part of that, according to his research, is ignoring the outliers. And I found that really interesting because it conflicts with the perspective that we bring when it comes to doing racial equity work or adaptive leadership. Um, the idea of protecting the voice of dissent um, is a part of adaptive leadership. So I'd love to um, invite you to talk about that, your group. And then also putting an emphasis on equity or racial equity. What sort of adaptations are you all making in your decision-making process so that it leads to equity? Um, I know right now on my screen, oh, now Helena's on the screen. I was going to say I'm the only black woman on my screen right now, but now Helena just popped up. Um, if all of us were to make a decision, Helena and I would get um, outvoted, right, from a racial standpoint. And so we have to be really mindful of our decision-making rules and how they lead to equities or inequities. So I'm going to have Vicki move you into your breakout, and the check-in questions or the gracious space questions are in the chat. We'll see you back in a few minutes. Welcome back. I feel like that was a juicy question. Love to hear from a couple people. Hi, Kalika. Hi, Tammy. This is, hi, this is Tammy. In our group, Carlos, unfortunately, um, from Bellevue Life Spring, did not have um, his audio working. So we were without one of our three voices. Um, okay. Yeah, um, but we heard Reggie was talking about how she works with the city of Kirkland and youth and how bringing, um, bringing youth into the conversation is important um, and asking them basically what they need. And then I brought up the whole idea of if we're going to solve these on a community level, if we're going to solve food insecurity at a community level, we need everyone to be at the table. We need to be able to look at a Zoom call and see people of color. We need to have people who speak a different language. We need to have different socioeconomic groups in order to be able to say everyone has a voice and make room for that voice at the table. For some reason, my box is lit up. I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to say something. I think one thing in our group we, we talked about was um, finding some common ground, you know, putting, creating situations where people can actually listen to each other without judgment and appreciate and understand how people grow up differently. They have different life experiences and that all serves to, to help create the lens that they look at race equity issues things like that so if we can create those spaces then we can at least um, plant seeds 
where even an outlier or a person who might be opposed to what we're trying to do and not in consensus can eventually wind up opening up their minds and hearts so that change does occur. So I, I hope that kind of summed up what we talked about. Feel free to jump in the other two people in the group. Sorry guys, my audio and stuff is not working very well. We can hear you, Christy. Can you? Okay, because I can't, I can't see like anything on my screen, so I'm having like technical difficulties. <laughs> Did you have some thoughts you wanted to share about the check-in question? What was the check-in question? I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, um, it's in the chat, so I'm going to put you on mute while um, I help you with that, okay? Does anybody else have a response to the... Yes, hi, Kalika. This is Angie. Um, hi. In our group, we talked about um, not only being present and having representation, but also really listening and accepting and trusting what, so if we're, if we have representation, it's not enough just to be at the table. It's that the perspective has to be, um, <coughs> has to be respected. And even if you don't understand it, um, just accept that this, what this person is telling you is their truth and their experience. Um, and then the other thing we talked about is what do we value as a group or as a society or as an organization? Do we value um, questioning and, and that, that kind of the edges? We were talking about conformity versus kind of maybe a radical point of view on either side and what happens when we lose those radical points of views on either side, either, either complacency or, or the other way, um, do we end up sometimes with mediocrity or do we end up with enough pushback and enough questioning? And so we were kind of exploring a lot of those different ideas in our group. Thank you, Angie. Patrick? Set up, set up the main, but well, good morning, everyone. So, um, in our group, I think uh, I'm hearing the same thing, and as people are sharing, we, I feel, especially working with young people, there's there, uh, there's there's a temptation sometimes to lose your authenticity in the voice just because of the popular um, uh, opinion of of others, especially when there's 70 young people in a room. Uh, it's hard to be the outlier to share your concerns and views that might not be that might be unique or, or unpopular. And I think as not just adults, but everyone needs, is responsible for creating that space to allow that voice. It's especially harder for youth of color to code switch, to, to think about how can they fit in. Do I, by expressing my need or views that are different from mainstream or others, is this something that puts me at risk? To, so I think that's, that's it's interesting. And especially as you weigh out the consensus and the greater, I guess, opinion of, of the mass of the group. Patrick, can I ask someone to kind of like summarize what you've heard from the group around um, how do we create space for the voice of dissent or the outliers or Patrick or the unpopular perspective? Does someone have a summary of what you've heard? Love to hear from someone I haven't heard from yet. I can kind of share a little bit while we talk and stuff. And actually, I, I, I don't think I will do a good job to share what the team did. But I had an idea about data. And, and data is so crucial for us to decision making and kind of following next steps and check progress and see who's doing that. But there is outliers in data. And, and then depending on the mission and vision of the project or the organization, uh, we should recognize who are the outliers 
within our analysis and, and how we're collecting and, and who's participating in data collection. So I, I think outlier is not a bad thing at all. Like it's, it's really difficult not to have an outlier, I think, but what is, what, what we can do is recognize that there will be outliers and, and how can we be aware of the impact of having outliers and how can we solve later on and that kind of align it to the mission. So uh, yeah, that's the thought. And then, so, so kind of uh, Alma recognized that, that NISO has that as a mission, right? To, to kind of bring outliers to, to the table and have them be part of a bigger conversation and part of the numbers. So, so that could be a partnership that can happen between organizations that have similar missions to, to tap into organizations like that. And we talked a bit about um, seeking to understand the outlier, to ask questions and um, understand, I would say, I would use the words, the larger story behind the outlier's perspective. Um, and our group felt like, um, you know, oftentimes it's the disenfranchised that are outliers and that um, it was important to make space to hear the outlier. Thank you, Lisa. So I just want to offer when I'm listening and reflecting on what I've heard, this is about, um, it's clear that this group has a collective consciousness around the why. Um, and I'm wondering what the how looks like. Like we know that it's important to create space for other perspectives. Um, I've heard people name multiple dimensions of diversity, race, economic, age, um, language. But what does that look like for decision making, right? Because just having a voice at the table doesn't mean a decision is made influenced by that decision. Um, I also, um, I was on a conversation with someone the other day where they said, you know, we're, we're thinking about bringing the table to the people. And for me, I'm holding that as evidence of where their consciousness is around how to create equity, particularly racial equity. Um, and I think Patrick mentioned code switching earlier. And what I offer to that person is, I'm glad that you've recognized that doing things the way that you've always done them isn't going to work, which is why you thought to move the table to the people. But ultimately, what that table is founded and built on is inequitable. So a lot of times it's about taking those steps back to build the new table together. And that's where those values and culture and language and shared understanding all come together. How do we build the thing together so that we can work together? And I really want to acknowledge that, that this group has done that. And I know today is hard. I can feel it in the air. I'm looking for you guys to breathe. I'm looking for your voices. So I don't want this meeting to seem deaf to what's happening in the world right now. We're not pushing forward to act like things aren't hard, but I think it's, I'm hearing it in all your voices around, we're all different, we all have different perspectives and there's a lot on the table. And so I just invite you to be really present and appreciative of the group that you built here because you have taken a lot of time to build shared language. You have built a lot of time to build to talk about things that are difficult to talk about. So just really lean into the space that you have today. And I hope that that gives you some comfort and some sense of belonging. And as Paul started us off by saying, whatever happens tomorrow, we still have a commitment and we still have roles and we still have people that look to us to do the things that we do best. So I really appreciate you taking this time together. Okay. And this is, yes, Helena. Oh, I was just going to add, if I could, you know, here in Bellevue, in particular, the east side in general, we tend to be type A personalities. That has been our culture. And I think part of the work that we're doing is changing that culture of having, being type A personalities and having to have to have decisions made in a certain way at a certain time or we're not productive. We don't see ourselves as being productive or result-based. And when you were talking about taking uh, uh, the table to the people, I kind of look at, can we get invited to the people's table? Uh, it is not to assume that the people don't have a table already. And the question is, have we been invited to that table? And, um, and, 
and to accept a cultural change that the way we've made decisions up until now is one of the changes that needs to change. Uh, and, uh, and that means that if and when we are privileged enough to be invited to the people's table because they trust us, then understand that the time frame, uh, the schedule that we're used to being on for giving results, especially to large institutions like the city and the school district and other entities, will have to change. Um, and how do we make that cultural shift? So that's just some of the things that go around in the back of my head. Thank you, Helena. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I feel like we can go home after that. <laughs> Don't log off. This is how I pay my bills, y'all. Stick around. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this is a really great tie-in to our data. Um, I have used up most of our data time today uh, just to create more space to be really present with you all. And I do acknowledge that there's a couple people ha who have logged on and logged off today. Um, and know that I always support you in doing what's best for you and taking good care of yourself because you all are critical human beings and you're also critical leaders in our community. Um, I wanted to bring a concept back to you all because at our last uh, data dialogue, um, you all were trying to set a target around um, <clears throat> how confident you all are that the work you're doing is leading to equity and increase of equity in our community. Um, and there's some deliberation and a recognition of multiple perspectives around the journey or the distance to becoming very confident about doing equity work looks different for each of us. Um, if you've ever in, in, attended like an Eastside Pathways training, you've watched a video on targeted universalism. And the idea there is that there's a goal that's universal, but the strategies to get to that goal are different for each group. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is curb cuts. So if you think about in a sidewalk, there's a dip in the curb in the, the sidewalk there. Um, a lot of leaders worked really hard to get those so that people who are using wheelchairs have an easier access to getting up on those sidewalks. But the impact was universal. People on scooters, moms with strollers, um, people on new scooters, right? So the idea here is the universal goal is that everybody can access and use sidewalks with ease. The, the strategy that was developed to create those curb cuts was really targeted to people um, using wheelchairs, but when they deployed that strategy, they found that it actually brought a lot of benefits to a ton of different people in the community. So all of that being said, the goal here is that the work that all of you are doing, you feel confident is dismantling inequities and increasing equity in the community. The journey to that is gonna look different for all of us. So I just wanted to offer that to this group so that when you're setting goals, um, there's not this thinking that like we all have to arrive to the same destination at the exact same time, because that's not real, right? The goal might be how does we all move towards being more confident, but the pathway to that is gonna look very different. So just a reminder um, here that you all adopted an improved setting goal that 85% of you feel very confident about knowing that the key factors in your area of focus and then we started to have some dialogue about feeling very confident about developing equity through your work. And then there was that big gap between 50, 90%. I'm not gonna take time to do um, target setting with you all today because it just seems tone deaf to the move that's been in the room. But I just wanted to bring that back to you to think about, um, you know, continuing to check in with yourselves and be honest about where you're at Right, like when I said in the check-in question, like you clearly have some consciousness about the multiple dimensions of diversity that need to be considered while you're doing your work, but it's applying those things that's really critical so that you can someday say you feel really confident about these things. Okay. So I'm gonna take a moment, I'm gonna turn my mic off, and I'm gonna let you sit with yourself and do a couple journaling around what are you gonna do differently so that by March of 2021, you feel more confident and hopefully very confident about these areas. You feel very confident that you really understand what's happening when you have time. Yes, I will put the previous slide up. Thank you, Helena. Um, 
um, you feel very confident about understanding what's happening in the work that you're doing. And not just from your perspective, but from multiple perspectives. Because you've done the work, you've had the conversation. You feel very confident that you know the technical things to go do. Technical meaning known solution. Those known solutions are things like getting invited to their table, bringing the table to them. You're also very confident that the work you're doing is increasing equity, not just reducing harm. You're also very confident that your group has identified an adaptive challenge, something that is unknown and will require multiple perspectives to figure out so that you can develop an adaptive solution. You've had the conversations to make sure you have what you need to get that thing done. So if I said every single student in Lake Washington Bellevue School District is gonna have a black teacher, where are those teachers? Right, it's kind of hard to do things that we don't have the resources to do. And lastly, you see yourself as a critical stakeholder in this work. And nobody can do that for you, but you. So I want to just take a moment to think about what are you going to do differently so that you can move to being more confident in these areas. I'm going to back up a slide for those of us who want to see the data, but it's just what are you going to do? What are the things that you're going to do to help you move towards that? I'm going to give you a couple minutes here. Okay, if you haven't already, I would love to start seeing you all share um, an action commitment or a, um, a curiosity you have in the chat box. Just one, share one of the things that you think you can do to move yourself in this direction. Also, feel free to unmute yourself if you need to. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Benjamin. I hope that sustainability also includes you, that you feel sustainable. Mm. Thank you, Jamie. I love that. Why is this set up this way? I love that question. Systems are designed for the outputs that they create, right? I think that's a really powerful question. Yeah. Um, I hope and invite you to really realize that um, systems are designed the way that they are, and therefore the roles that we step into in those systems are designed to hold the system in place as it exists. 
And each of us have to go on our own journey to examine why things are the way that they are and how that impacts ourselves and how that impacts the people around us. Um, and continue to do that work is really critical in shaping, reshaping the system. So I appreciate you all being courageous um, and know that this isn't just about what's happening Eastside Pathways. This is about helping you do your jobs better. This is about helping improve our communities, about uh, improving outcomes for kids. Uh, oh, I almost forgot. I did want to mention, um, you'll note that now Vicki and I are the um, only two from the backbone staff holding this space for you all. Um, and because of that, we recognize that you're not getting facilitating and coaching in your focus group. So I am now making my um, calendar open to each focus group for about 15 to 30 minutes per month to do some um, individual coaching and training. So please feel free to email me if your group is interested in setting up that time. So essentially what that looked like is I'll come in, um, listen to what you're, where you feel stuck, um, and then offer any sort of tools that I might have. Um, I'm not a magical fairy, but I try to be. So if there's something that I can help connect you with or any questions that I can ask or answer for you, um, uh, feel free to email and we'll set up that time. And once again, it's 50 to 30 minutes per month per group. Um, also know that I care about all of you, but I do not have enough time. There's not enough hours in the day to have one-on-ones with each of you on an individual level. So I do apologize, but I can do that at the focus group level. So thank you. Um, my email address is at the end. I can also put it in the chat if you don't have it. It's just click at eSidePathways.org. Um, I'm going to pass it to the remote group. Really excited for them to share all the work that they've been doing. Um, this is their fish scale. So if you remember doing the fish scale, it's kind of just a graphic organizer for holding all the thinking and work that we've done. Yes, Tammy, I have three kids. Thank you. And I'm not going to lie, they're not thriving. This year is hard. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that, Tammy. Um, I'm going to pass it to remote. Um, I'm going to give you guys about like five, six minutes just to talk about the work that you're doing in your small test and change. Um, I think it's really exciting and invite everybody else to just kind of just actively listen, um, think about um, their process and the work that they're doing and what you might learn from that. So uh, remote, I'm going to pass it to you. And Benjamin, you want to take it from here? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Benjamin Rondan, Bellevue School District. I'm the engagement coordinator supporting elementary schools. Uh, so before I go in really fast, I want to acknowledge our team. So if everybody wants to say hi and just return on their camera, up, that'll be great. Hi, this is Jamie with Kids Quest Children's Museum. I'm on the remote living and learning group. Hi, I'm Chris Ensline. I'm a volunteer with Eastside Pathways. I'm Cassandra Sage, and I'm a board director for the Lake Washington School District. I'm Lisa Harold, and I'm a part of uh, Bell Press Kid Reach, which does K through 12 uh, free tutoring. And I'm also, um, and that is a, a, a program within Bellevue Presbyterian Church that serves primarily Bellevue School District and Lake Washington School District. Hi, I'm Liliana Lil Lil Mena from Padres Unidos for la Educación from Brandon High School. I'll jump in. Um, I'm Reggie Schubiger. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator for the city of Kirkland. Sorry. <laughs> Great, so that's kind of like the team that has been meeting um, and, and working around this project. Um, just wanted to give them credit and visibility because many times I want to speak all the time, but anyway, that's our team and that's where we're working. So as we, as the screen shows, we are working around K-5 great uh, Latinx families and Lake Washington and Bellevue School District. And the idea was to learn what, uh, how are they perceiving uh, remote learning? What are some of the barriers and what are some of the ways that we can support them? So it was, we did a focus group with nine 
Uh, seven, seven to nine parents, I don't remember quite well, but the, we, we talked about um, remote learning and it was in Spanish and the members of the committee use interpreter devices to hear the, the information in English. So this was made for two reasons. One was to uh, have families feel comfortable sharing their ideas, thoughts, and observations, and also for us uh, and other English speakers, or uh, yeah, uh, to to experience what it feels to to fill a meeting in a second language and through an interpreter. Uh, so uh, that itself was a rich observation, and it was a really good way to understand some of the barriers that this community has. Um, so the things that we heard. Um, Sorry, I don't have them all in my, in my head right now, but they kind of surrounded around communication and access to information. Um, we heard also about supports, especially those that have kids with special needs. And uh, also feeling that they, even though they get information, many times the information was not accessible for reasons. It could be too much information, it was uh, the information sometimes that they received was assuming that they understood the terminology or they had the context. Always. So from there, we, we kind of think fast and say, okay, we can do something really immediate, uh, which is a video kind of with the updated news of the week or the, the two weeks that have come by, especially now because we thought there was a lot happening, especially with the transition that was gonna happen to back to school and then that decision uh, changing in, in among like a week. So we thought that's important information that we should kind of give out to families. So we create a 15 minute video in Spanish with both of, uh, with both of the districts in mind. And this um, well, was shared under the ESAT Pathways YouTube channel, Facebook channel, and then the idea is that we disseminate it through all the Eastside network with actually those that you serve, uh, if you feel that are within our target group. Anything that I miss? So, so one last thing, sorry. Uh, so I think this is not the end, obviously. This is just a, a beginning. And it's the, the idea is to keep looking into ways that we can support them better. So the video is just, Small test of change around communication, very specific to, to that end. Uh, but I feel uh, this work continues. I, I think that that that's not the solution itself, but, but it's just a step further. Um, the idea is to keep bringing families back and understanding if the videos work, what else can we do? And kind of start a conversation with them. all for sharing. So I brought this back up um, just to kind of help the group kind of formulate some thinking or questions around how to like unpack the work that this group is doing. Um, but definitely I know taking a pause, does anybody else from the remote group want to share? I saw a lot of head nodding and feeling like that was good. Okay, awesome. I just so, like, oh, sorry. Please, no, go ahead. You want me to share in the chat? No, please go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that um, the quality of the video was amazing. Benjamin and Liliana, I mean, looked like professional news anchors presenting the information. They had a music intro. They had, you know, they had text in Spanish and they had screenshots showing you where on the website you could access things. So for people like me who are visual learners anyway, even though my Spanish isn't great, I could kind of follow along what they were doing. So. Great job, guys. I, I want to give the credit to Liliana. I just look for news and I talk. Liliana did everything and she's great. She spent her Sunday doing this. So big kudos to her and thank you. 
Yeah, kudos to you both. I wanted to add to that, that one of the things that we heard in the focus group was that um, sometimes things were communicated with the assumption that they understood what they were talking about when they were giving the information. And the video, you know, we all learn differently and we learn best, I think, when um, we can see it, hear it, uh, and, um, you know, just and, and have that impact and involvement. And I thought the video did a really good job of um, the visual aspect of, of walking families through what they were talking about. Um, it is in Spanish, but it just seemed like it was really catered towards assuming that um, they don't have much of a frame of reference for uh, utilizing services and doing the things that the video talked about. It was just really well done. And that was uh, Liliana and Benjamin, absolutely. Thank you. One just thing walk. before we go to Kalika, I know we're super fast. And the yeah, thing no rush. important will be to have the, the video not sit in a shelf. So maybe disseminate it. So really encourage everybody to disseminate it with their Latino population um, because it really we feel that it, it, that it can help. But if it stay, stays in the in the in the cloud, uh, I don't think we'll do the impact it has to do. So please share. Thank you, Benjamin. I'm a YouTuber. You see, like and subscribe. <laughs> He's an influencer. I love it. We're going to get you sponsored. <laughs> So I just want to walk us through um, the performance measures because um, I kind of heard a lot and, and, you know, for the people who are listening, I invite you to jump in here as well. Um, but I thought that was really cool, Benjamin, as you walked us through the process of you all knowing confidently what the factors were that drive in the current state, right? So doing a, a video is not like a new concept. Doing a video in Spanish is not a new concept. But what I did hear was that you built enough relationship to understand that that wasn't enough. It was the way that the video and the information was being provided that was one of the adaptive challenges. So you dug deeper than that, right? It's easy for us to say, we're just going to do a video in Spanish and they can figure out the rest. And I'm hearing that you guys went a step further, right? And you were able to know what that next step was because you have the dialogue. Um, so moving down to that technical solution, right? The video using it in Spanish is the technical part. The adaptive part is really understanding Benjamin and we were saying like they didn't understand the context or the technical terms or like where to find things. So that was going deeper to discover something unknown and then coming up with a solution for it. Um, and then I loved when you were talking about like we did something now immediately because that in and of itself is a part of, from my perspective, racial healing. Because when you continue to tell people something, this hurts, this sucks, this isn't working, this hurts, this sucks, this isn't working, and people don't take action, I think it continues to rub into that wound. So I really appreciated you guys saying, we may not have it all figured out, but we're going to take action now. And I think that's going to create more equity access. Um, and then I, I love, just... yeah, Chris, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Kalika, didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I, it, if, it, if I could just inter intercept right there. Um, I think the team did an awesome, fast job. I think our challenge, our adaptive challenge is um, integrating this into the powers to, to be communication channels, make it work. So um, I, I'm just not sure how sustainable or how appropriate it is that Eastside Pathways and our awesome partners take on the job from the school districts or the cities or whoever, that this should be part of their, they should bring this, they should be part of this, um, if I could be so bold as, as to propose that. Thank you. And I think the other part to add on to what Chris is saying is, yes, we're getting it out by the big school districts, but is that where families are still getting their information? Because if they've lost the um, trust in those institutions, are they going to continue to gather information from those institutions? So that's why I think it continues to, you have to continue to use partnerships and the people that people trust to be able to get out those information. I still agree with Chris that you need to have um, 
the bigger institutions need to help with this, but we, as what we heard from a lot of the families, yes, they get information from the school district, but they don't always understand what that is. So I think that we have to build that trust back up and community groups um, have that trust and which is why that collective impact model is so powerful. Thank you. Um, I loved, as you guys are thinking about, um, that transitions nicely to this conversation about BART, right? Like, what do you need in order to go big, to systematize this, to roll this out, to expand this thing? Um, and I want to lean back into that video we watched at our previous meeting around understanding the historical context. And I think, Jamie, that supports what you were saying around um, where are the places and spaces that we take this next and being really um, mindful of the relationship that your target audience has with this, um, this organization or this space? I know every time I have to go do something on a school campus, I can just feel my blood rising, right? Because my experiences on school campuses weren't positive. It wasn't a safe space for me. Um, so I'm like, can we do it somewhere else? Um, so I really appreciate you all starting to think about that. And I think there's no doubt that you're all critical stakeholders. But I'd love to hear from um, the group, the remote group, or others on, you know, what are some other curiosities you had about this group process? I'm seeing lots of, like, high fives, but I'm wondering if anybody has any critical questions about the process or um, curiosities about next steps. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I think Liz Mills asked a really good um, question about is Facebook and YouTube a new table? And I, I think, I don't, I'm sorry, the terminology, I don't know the terminology, but what I know is that Facebook and YouTube are great conductors of information and can provide access. So, 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 I don't know if the table itself can be YouTube and Facebook, but I, I think using those tools um, to connect with the families, it was culturally responsive from us. It was an initiative to, to kind of, this is culturally responsive because they will not check a, to, to Jamie's point, the BSD website for these kind of videos. So we will need to bring it to them. And also they may not check ESAT pathways YouTube channel. That's why it has to be shared by an organization that they feel kind of value, right? So it's like, okay, if you provide a service to them, they probably will see the link that you share. Um, but maybe they're not going to go into your set pipes and check for that. It could be also interesting to maybe pay some dollars in Facebook and, and see if we can target the, the, the video. Five bucks, 10 bucks. Any other questions from folks? I see a thumbs up. I don't see any hands raised or questions. Okay. So thank you, Cassandra, for sharing uh, the link to the video in the chat. I heard a request from the group to uh, share this information in this tool. As Benjamin said, please don't leave it on the shelf. Um, I also invite you to think about what um, you heard from the group and how that might, those learnings might be applied to the work that you're doing. Um, and so I'm going to switch gears here and thank you all for the work remote that you're doing. It's phenomenal. I'm really excited. Um, and I have to let you know that as we started these COVID cans, our national coach from Strive Together said to us, if you can just solve for the group of kids who aren't um, online engaging, then that would be huge. So um, I'm just so honored that Eastside Pathways has you all continually showing up and doing the work in these five areas of focus. Uh, and I'm so hopeful and encouraged to see the impact that you all will make. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to give back the rest of the time today. You're going to have about uh, 25 minutes in your focus group. And in just a moment, Vicki's going to be uh, sharing the link to your ERS. It's been a really long time. Vicki's so good. Can we just give a high five to Vicki? Because she's so ready and on it. Look at that. It's like magic. <laughs> so 
Thank you, Vicki. So there's a link to your ERS workbooks. It's been months. July 28th was the last time that we looked at this. Um, and I just want to invite you all to take some time looking at this in your group and think about where you feel confident, where you feel really strong. Um, and I, if I may, I remember going to a remote group and, and hearing you guys say, like, I don't know how we got here, but I'm not sure if there's a straight clear through line. Going back and like tightening things back up based upon what you know now um, is really cool because you, you check for understanding in your group. And I know that was a working agreement we said we could lean in today was checking for understanding. Are you all on the same page about what this looks like? Um, one of the beauties of doing adaptive work, one of the beauties of asking them what they want is that this is constantly changing and evolving. The deeper you go, the more conversations you have, the more trust and relationships you build, the stronger, more clear and authentic this gets. Um, and really this is, as I mentioned, a graphic organizer for being able to capture what those things are. So as we're going out into the community, we can be really clear about the work that we're doing. So if you haven't already, please open your workbook. We're gonna be moving you into your groups in just a few moments. Are there any questions? Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm not missing. Um, has everybody seen this? I know we've had a couple of people that are new. Are there any questions about the fish scale, the purpose, how it works? Questions about why we're spending time on this? <laughs> uh, Kalika, um, I, if this is our first time being on the call uh, in the first, you know, the last couple of months, do we just choose which focus group we want to join or does it matter? Um, what group do you feel like would most align with the work that you do, Christy? Um, probably the remote living and learning group. Okay, awesome. Thank you. We'll put you in there. Um, this is a really great time. And this is also, I appreciate you asking that question, Christy, because this is a really great tool um, that you might use to draw information when you're trying to bring other people along. So Christy's new in the room and be able to say to Christy, like, we're worried about kids um, attending school while experiencing remote learning. Um, and our focus population is Latinx students. Um, particularly those whose first language is in English, and um, our core indicator is tracking the attendance to school. One of the key factors was that we heard from people that information access was a challenge, um, and one of our strategies is doing a video newsletter in Spanish. So be, be able to walk that fish scale from the top to the bottom. We can cr quickly get someone new like Christy on board. And then Christy might say, okay, that totally makes sense. I'll share the videos with all my constituents, all my people, all of my community. So that's really one of the benefits of having this graphic organizer is being able to quickly and succinctly say the same thing about. Um, uh, Janice, thank you. I'm saying it out loud because Vicki does the, uh, the organizing. So Janice Morse would also like to be in remote please. Thank you, Janice. So that's kind of the purpose of this. And then know that as we're starting to do that target setting, that's helping prime you all to begin measuring the work that you're doing. Um, and I think Benjamin spoke to this earlier around data. It's really important to have data so that we can use it to make decisions. We can also use it to track and acknowledge the impact of the progress that we're making. Any other questions about this? Okay, we're gonna move you all into your breakout groups. Um, don't hesitate to use the ask for help button if you need any support. We'll see you back in 25 minutes. I just wanna like thank everybody for staying at the table. And I know the last group I was this was acknowledging like the fatigue of doing this work. And I'm sure today of all days that feels even more challenging, um, but know that you're on the right track. Like you're here and that is huge. Like that's the first step, right? Is acknowledging there's a problem. Um, and just take some time to really be clear on like what your culture is in your group. Like if your culture says, we're centering the people that we wanted to create change on behalf of as decision makers, then know that you don't have to make the decision. You just have to create the space for the decision being made. Don't stress yourself out, right? Um, I also want to offer that I came in and was doing some notes in there um, because what our notes or our summary of our work is an evidence of our current consciousness and thinking. So one of the groups I made a note about how could you reframe what you've written to shift the power dynamics in a statement, right? So if you're saying like, oh, these people aren't in the room um, and we know that's a problem, maybe you could go a little bit deeper and talk about why. 
right? Like our organization is designed, our current decision-making culture is designed to work with people who can fund initiatives, which inherently means we're not inviting people who don't have dollars to bring to the table. Like how can you frame something that holds the system accountable for how it's currently designed? Because then you're closer to being able to move from where you are. How do you get really specific about things? So if you have something that says, and I'm kind of cherry picking things that I read, if you have something that says like, oh, there's certain documents that people need that make this process hard, write out what those specific documents are because then you're closer to being able to take action. Then you can go and have dialogue about, do we really need people's birth certificates to hand out free lunches? Do we really need that, right? Then you can have more crisp conversations. So get really specific in your documents about what those problems are because documents is just too loosey-goosey and broad. So thank you all. A last reminder that if you want to get some one-on-one -on -one coaching for your group, please email me and we'll schedule that time. Um, I'm happy to block it out for once a month all the way up until March. I'm so encouraged by the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you back these last two minutes of your day. And if you're able to stay on to do um, feedback with us, we appreciate that. Otherwise, be well, celebrate, um, get lots of rest, and we'll see you back on December 1st.